And the President General of Ohanez and Igbo Worldwide, Professor George Obiazo, says there is a conspiracy of the elite to deny Indigo the presidency in 2023. Obiazo, who is speaking for the first time since the conclusion of the presidential primaries of both the People's Democratic Party as well as the All Progressive Congress, says it is now clear that the Nigerian national political elite have successfully orchestrated to deny the Southeast an opportunity to produce the president of Nigeria come 2023. In the statement titled, What Does Nigeria Want from Ndibo? Made available to the National Publicity Secretary uh, of the Ohanez Ndibo, Dr. Alex Obunaya, Obiazo described the outcome of the presidential primaries of the two major political parties as gross injustice against the Igbo beyond expectations. To discuss this issues further, we're now being joined by our in-house analyst, Mahmoud Jaga, as well as Frank Tete. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the program. And this is, you know, not unexpected, looking at, you know, the body language of the Southeast prior to the presidential primaries of major political parties. Yes, said, this is a time for the Igbos. Frank Tete, I want to start with you. You've listened to George Obiazo, the national president of Ohanez and Igbo. He says there is a conspiracy against the Igbos. Do you agree with him? Well, not quite. Um, the, uh, let, me, let us say that uh, the, we, Nigeria has not yet uh, attained that political maturity that will give the, have the understanding that it uh, has to be that inclusive especially of the Igbos who feel quite alienated after the civil war, uh, before and after the civil war. One would have thought that by now uh, it would have been a matter of consensus that uh, the, 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 the polity would generally agree that it would have been the turn of the southeast. I do not think it's a, it's a form of conspiracy. It is rather a, a, the lack of... Uh, a development, a political development, the, 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 both the polity, the people in general, and those who actually wield political power, uh, wield influence, have not yet reached that point when they know that, when they, when they agree that, I think it's time for more uh, inclusiveness in our politics. I think that's what we should be working on. Unfortunately, uh, given the clamor that the Ohanese uh, were worldwide, uh, put together and with a lot of sympathy from uh, mainly southern Nigeria, south, south, south southern Nigeria, one would have thought that uh, it would have been easier this time. So, well, but it's not yet over until, until it's over. We, we have a Peter Obi who is a gathering storm, like a perfect storm. You know, after the primaries of the two major political parties, Peter Obi has eventually metamorphosed into a movement that he claims he, ca he can no longer control. So Peter Obi is no longer that Southeastern candidate. He's becoming a nationalistic, you know, worldwide candidate for this uh, coming election. So that should assuage whatever form of uh, mindset of conspiracy against the Igbos. Right. Well, Mahmoud Jaga, I want to come to you right now. Frank Tete has said, you know what, Epita Obi, who is being regarded as that thought force, but we'll talk about him much later. But let's talk about the Southeast in general. Do you think mm -hmm. the geopolitical zones has actually played its politics enough to actually warrant such a demand, especially looking at major political parties in the country? Well, uh, <coughs> I think that is essentially the problem. Uh, because uh, the way Nigerian political parties operate, before they will zone or even endorse a presidential candidate from a certain part of the country, they must see demonstrable support for the party in that part of the country, which is why, for example, in APC, it was always very unlikely that uh, it will produce a presidential candidate from the southeast because uh, in the south it has the greatest support in the southwest. That, that's the logic of politics here. Now, it should have been slightly more different in PDP, which, because traditionally the southeastern states have voted for uh, PDP since 1999, although right now there are two APC governors, one uh, Abga governor, and only two PDP <coughs> governors. But politicians make other calculations. You see, for example, which candidate 
is most likely to win the election. That is, in fact, the, the most important thing because the whole purpose mm -hmm. of a party contesting election is to win, you know, just run for the hell of it or just to uh, make a point. And certain factors, even for PDP, have complicated uh, the matter for a presidential candidate from the Southeast, specifically the violence by IPOP. It has poisoned the atmosphere, especially in the North, uh, also in, in the West and in Lagos. So there is this calculation that if we put a candidate from there, we, we'll eat. You know, politicians may not say that uh, openly, but all these factors play uh, in their mind. But also, in the end, it boils down to individuals. Uh, like in PDP, you have a candidate like Atiku Avakar, very experienced, uh, reportedly wealthy and uh, everything. And uh, he just uh, did the better calculation and grabbed the, 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 the ticket. In APC, more or less, the same thing. You had one strong candidate, although there was some element of zoning there. Because the northern APC governor said, let's leave it to the southern candidates. But then, among the southern candidates, who are very many, one of them who was very strong, made his calculations, had been working very hard, despite all the allegations of shortcomings, he grabbed the ticket. So, in the end, you can't grab, but you know, you can never rule out a situation where an outstanding individual rises from any part of the country. I'm thinking of like Chief MKO Abiola, without zoning, without anything, mm -hmm. an outstanding figure rises onto the political scene and uh, carries uh, himself on his own steam. Abiola didn't win because he said give it to your vow or to anything. You know, on his own steam and national standing he raided his way you know to the election. Well that was prior to the era of social media which mm -hmm. has a lot of influence if we must admit it especially as it concerns the young people. But Frank Tete I want to come to you right now look at the fact that you know uh, Mahmoud Jega did speak about the fact that the Southeast, especially major political parties, the PDP, for instance, Section 37 of the party, did speak about zoning. And one would have thought since in 2018, after the convention in Port Hackett, that this year the Southeast should have produced the presidential candidate. But we've seen what has played out so far. But if you look at it, the only Southern Eastern candidates that actually came top five came number five, speaking about I am pious, I am. So what does that say really about the PDP and its influence on the geopolitical zone, which feels it is its right at this time to produce the next president of the country? Not necessarily a, more, a legal right, probably an understanding that is fitting for the Southeast to have produced the PDP presidential candidate. Mamu Jega will agree that we are in an era where betrayal is seem to, seem to be uh, uh, creeping into our political lexicon in such a, a manner that he should write a column on that. You know, so yeah, so the southeastern uh, southeastern politicians will feel that they have actually been betrayed. Uh, we are not going to mention names, and uh, they also believe that. And then they saw it coming. They saw how the PDP, you know, developed to a point where they said, well, they were throwing its candidacy open. I mean, that was the first sign that they were not going to get it. So uh, people like us who attempted, wanted to be subjective, praised the APC for being very definitive and kept to it. Even at that, we still But it's stuck to south, not uh, necessarily south No, 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 but we east. saw the Ahmed Lawans also uh -huh. coming in and the uh, Yerima, Sani Yerima also coming in. So uh, the, the, the zoning so, so does not really have that kind of legal power mm. that it has been ascribed to, to, to it. You know, it's not so constitutional. It may be in the PDP constitution, but it doesn't follow. The, there is really no constitutional uh, basis for it. I'm talking about um, uh, the, the federal constitution, even though section 14 or section 2 establishes the federal character principle, but it's not something that anybody can hang on. However, I think that uh, the, the, given the, the I empires I that you cited, mm -hmm. it shows that even Southeasterners themselves do not have confidence in what they are asking for. To the right. extent that the delegates who went to that convention, especially the PDP convention, they didn't even vote for a, a figure like Kanye Pius Aim that right. was being propped up. Well, he got 14 votes at the end of the day, even though Ebo Yusuf had about 13 delegates. But you know what? We'll come back and continue this conversation, especially looking forward, especially to that much talked about thought force 
in the policy as we look forward to the 2023 general elections. Of course, you're still watching News Night. Do stay with us here on Arise News. We'll be back after this quick break with more analysis with our guest in the studio. Welcome back. You're still watching News Night here on Arise News. I am Amaka Ude Walker. And the absence of the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, who is away from the country, is reportedly hampering beads to reconcile members of the party who are grieved by his choice of a running mate. Some party chieftains, including uh, Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State and former Ekiti State Governor Ayofayo Shea, have in the last few days expressed displeasure over the state of affairs of the party. While Otom criticized the way the River State Governor Yesum Wike was treated in the run up to the emergence of a running mate, Fayoshe, who participated in the presidential primary, said it is time for the South to produce the president or nothing. A former governor of Plato State, Jonah Jang, had also expressed a reservation over the way Atiku disregarded the recommendations of the committee set up to choose the running mate for him and went ahead to pick Governor Ifai Okowa of Delta State. And the national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Iyoche Ayu, is now at the center of a cold war between the presidential candidate of the party, Atiku Abubakar, and the River State Governor, Yesum Wike. We're following the presidential primaries and the selection of a running mate for the party. Some party chieftains who are sympathetic to Wike have condemned the party chairman for the way he handled the matter so far. But Governor of Benue State and former Governor of Ekiti State have opened, expressed their displeasure on developments on the party. What well, sources within the party say the main contention now is the position taken so far by the national chairman, which is seen as favoring one side. With the tension within the PDP, there is also a possibility that some aggrieved members will be rooting for the removal of Ayu. And mass defection has rocked the Casino State chapter of the All Progressive Congress as 5,000 members of the ruling party in Matazu and Masawa local government areas of the state have defected to the People's Democratic Party. The leader of the defectors, Ali Maikano, said they decided to join the main opposition party due to what he described as injustice meted on them by the APC leadership during the party primaries in the state. Maikano, who was amongst the aspirants who vied for APC tickets to represent Matazu uh, Musawa Federal Constituency of the Federal House of Representatives, says they left the party because of undemocratic principles of its leaders. Receiving the defectors in Matazu, the state chairman of the PDP, Salisu Yusuf Majigiri, assured them of fairness and equity in their new party. Well, let's bring in our Rise News analyst, uh, Frank Tete, as well as uh, Mahmoud Jega, who are still in the studio with me. And of course, we're having a conversation really about, you know, the polity and how it's hitting up, especially as we look forward to the 2023 general elections. Well, Mahmoud Jega, I want to come to you right now, especially looking at the fact that, um, you know, members of the PDP, especially in the southern geopolitical zone, I generalize it now because of all we have heard and seen so far, they're saying... The zone is not being treated fairly, especially with the emergence of um, Atiku Abubakar as the flag bearer of the party. And of course, Ifai Okowa being the vice presidential candidate, going against the committee that was set up by the party, which actually chose Wike over an Okowa. So the, the, the PDP in the Southeast, this used to be the stronghold of the party. So looking ahead to 2023, what should the party be doing right now to reclaim its lost glory? Well, you know, like on the issue of presidential candidate now, uh, it is like uh, closing the stables after the horses have bolted because nobody can do anything about that. There was a convention which is the highest organ of the party and it elected a presidential candidate. <laughs> I think the matter is legally and constitutionally settled uh, at that point. Now, 
It is the prerogative of a presidential candidate to nominate his running mate. Of course, uh, the prerogative is not absolute because you have to make consultation and uh, do what is best for the party and that will enhance its electoral uh, fortunes. Maybe Atiku Abakal made the mistake of appointing a committee and uh, if what we are hearing is right... The party did right, appoint that committee, not Atiku Abubakar himself. The party it was the party who did come up with that 14-man uh, committee. And at least according to what one of the members said, most of the committee members voted for Wike, but then the presidential candidate settled for a different person. Well, he must have made his own calculations. And probably we will never know the reason until when he writes his uh, memos, because you know you don't say exactly what your reasons are now until after the whole thing uh, is over. I can see maybe some of the problems of running with Governor Wiki, although he is uh, one of the strongest individuals in the PDP, a pillar of its support, who even came second in the convention, but probably he is a bit uh, controversial that you may not want to run with him on a national uh, platform. Maybe that is the candidate's uh, consideration. And then he now took uh, Governor Okoa, who is much more... <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end of the day, the PDP has an election to win or lose. Frank Tete, let me come to you right now. Let's have a conversation about the third force. If we cast our mind back to the election in 2019, the likes of Kingsley Mongalu, uh, even Omoyele Showare, a lot of people thought that these people would have actually posed a threat to the ruling party. And we saw how the, <laughs> their turnout was at the elections. But here we are now, looking ahead to 2023. We've now seen a Peter Obi who have actually left the PDP and now joined the Labour party and others were actually saying maybe there might be an upset for the thought force to actually dismantle the two ruling party speaking about the APC and the PDP so in your opinion as someone who has actually worked the politics of Nigeria even before 20, uh, 1999 do you think there's a chance that a thought force might pull an upset in the forthcoming general polls do you believe so uh, not yet not yet uh, it's, it's a gathering storm but it hasn't reached the crescendo yet, so we can't really judge whether such a thought force could uh, pull Not such even a all the, the no, weights that Peter Obi is have, pulling no, no, on no. socials? Oh, yes, indeed. It's a movement. And that movement is worldwide, Mark you. It's because everybody that is interested in black Africa's greatest country, Nigeria, you know, is, you know, wants to know that whether there is a third force to at least change the story, change the paradigm from the two-party system that we've had between the two major political parties, either MPN or UPN, and now PDP and uh, APC. What, first and foremost, there is a huge disappointment in the, in the obedient movement because of the, the, the understanding that hasn't worked between the NNPP of Kwan Kwaso and uh, Peter Obi. It's a big disappointment because uh, they know that, that the, the obedient movement is strong. I describe it as a coming and perfect storm, but it hasn't made serious inroads in the north. So with another movement, the person of uh, Rabbi Ukwankwaso, who is creating, uh, you know, another kind of uh, the Kwankwasiya movement that has actually, you know, rocked the boats in Kano State and a, a lot part of uh, Northwest, one would have thought that such an understanding would have actually nearly created that uh, thought force that we're talking about. Now, given our electoral history, whether pre-independence, post-independence, and in the, in the Second Republic, we haven't had a third force. It's not usually easy to, to, to have. Now, you had to take the APC to organize a merger. Now, in this current circumstances, a merger is no longer possible. It's no longer legally possible. So uh, we will wait because this obedient movement, this uh, Peter Obi movement, uh, I mean, kept on having this, its force after the primaries of the two major political parties. Now that um, it, it's, it's lost out in terms of uh, having an understanding of Kwan Kwaso, one would now begin to think whether they can make, they can sell themselves, sell itself as a movement to the North. Because mm. whether you like it or not, Northern Nigeria is a political powerhouse. Absolutely. And anybody that wants to actually give a shot to the presidency, given the provisions of Section 134, have, I mean, given the fact that, I mean, you have to win one quarter of the votes in 
two thirds of the states in two this country. Yeah. So it's not enough if Peter Obi sweeps the the, 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 the votes in no, south 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 he east. He needs the north really to be able to be announced as the next president of Nigeria. And that brings me to you, Mahmoud Jaga, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. looking just taking off from where uh, uh, Frank Tete did stop. One would have thought that you know a merger of uh, the NNPP led by uh, Kwanko. So looking at his Kwanko Siam movement and you know all the force that they've actually been making in the last couple of months and a Labour Party headed by Peter Obi, who is a uh, presidential flag bearer. Maybe that might have, you know, given us some sort of upset in the 2023 election. But from Kwankwaso's comments right now, it's like that might not happen. So do you think, you know, asking you the same question I'd asked uh, Bryce Frank Tete mm -hmm. earlier, do you think in the 2023 election that a thought force might just pull a surprise on the rest of us? Well, as you said, uh, these two, the NNPP and the Labour movement, are the two parties apart from the two main ones that have been making waves in this election cycle personally i am not surprised that they failed to reach an understanding konkoso said in gombe that the issue is who will become the presidential candidate and who will become the running mate and uh, each side produced a criteria that is self-serving uh, like Konkoso said, let's look at uh, who held the most offices. Because, you know, he was once deputy speaker, <laughs> he was two-term governor, he was minister. And, and even uh, a senator. Uh, yeah, and senator and senator. So that's why they brought that uh, self-serving criteria. But the main issue, as I see it, is this. In both NNPP and Labour Party, the supporters have raised their leader to a cult status. Mm. So the support base is non-transferable. That's the way it looks to me. Konkoso cannot transfer his support base to Peter Obi and vice versa. Because the whole thing has been built up like a cult. And if the leader is not the presidential candidate, the whole support base collapses. You cannot easily say, go and vote and I'm the running mate. Because, you know, the way these supporters see it, the presidential candidate is all or nothing. Uh, people don't really vote because of running mates. People mostly vote because of presidential candidates. So honestly, I'm not surprised that the two of them fail to work together. And if they don't work together, then possibly there is no serious third force in the 2023. Right. Election. And Bryce, yeah. Frank Tate, let's look at the fact yeah. that uh, there has been this clamor, especially from the All Progressive Congress, the southeastern uh, 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 level. Now, they're saying they might just demand for certain positions, looking at the Senate presidency and even the secretary to the government of the Federation. Do you think this would be enough to actually assuage all of the clamors prior to the presidential primaries of major political parties to say it is a south term of the southeast but now they are saying even the senate presidency or even secretary general that's I, I, the secretary I, I, I to the think, government i of think the, the southeast should settle for a more concrete uh, agreement that will actually make one of its own the president of this country in no distant future don't you think that's a bit too late now uh, no not no 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 it, it, i mean it, 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 we're talking about in another okay. dispensation we're not talking about this time around okay. You know, I belong to the school of thought that Alex Ekweme was preparatory to becoming the president if uh, uh, the uh, Buhari coup didn't take place against uh, Shewu Shagari. Alex Ekweme was vice president in 1979 to 1983. They won a re-election. And they could have actually, if they had stayed on to 1987, with the kind of power that Alex Okume uh, was wielding in the MPN at that time, with the kind of uh, uh, you know, national spread MPN had, Alex Okume would have been the president of this country. We still have individuals like Alex Okume in the Southeast. They need to look for them, not uh, individuals that spring up from nowhere, but the ones that are actually that, that have in, been able to integrate to the other parts of Nigeria the way Alex Okoyeme did. So, they, uh, uh, someone like um, Emeka Nyaku, for example, could have been able to fit that kind of personality, except that age could not be on his side. But they need to look more closely. I am Pius I am has that mien of uh, personality that is acceptable to the other parts, the rest of Nigeria, or northern Nigeria, southern Nigeria. So I think they should be negotiating as to supporting a, a, an agreement, uh, an individual, a political party that will give a long-term promise that is concrete enough for it to be able to be satisfied. Well,
Excel promise that seems to be something that is missing because if you look at the PDP, for instance, where the South East came a distant fifth, I have to still re recollect that. And the vote was quite paltry, if you ask me, if you compare it to the winner of the presidential primary, that's Atiku Abubakar, or even the person who came second year some week. And I reply, I'm got 14 votes. And if you look at the Southeast in general, yes, we have the lowest vote, especially looking at uh, the Electoral Act as signed into law. The South had lesser votes. And of course, the Southeast having just five states as compared to six as to other Southern states had lesser. But still, one would have thought if the South had actually decided it is time for the South to emerge, maybe, just maybe, Mahmoud Jega, let me come to you real quick right now. As we look forward to the elections, we're getting ready to wrap up these conversations, really. Um, do you think the Southeast has actually done enough groundwork, really, as a geopolitical zone to galvanize behind maybe just not one candidate, but a couple of candidates to say, these are the people we're believing and they should lead, not just this, <coughs> the region, but Nigeria in general? You see, madam. Do you think that would have changed things? I don't know. And uh, every election cycle comes with its own new considerations, like uh, Frank was saying. By 2027, it will be a whole different ball game, different personalities, different conditions. But you see this matter that you spoke about earlier, about the negotiation, that, okay, for now, let us have Senate president. And uh, as the, you see, even that, in political bargaining, it, you don't just make a demand until you can show also the electoral strength that you can bring mm -hmm. to the table. You don't just sit back, uh, probably no contribution, substantial one to the victory, and say, I must be given this. In 1999, when Obasanjo won the presidential ticket of uh, PDP, he immediately asked other leaders that, look, let us concede the Senate presidency to the PDP. I mean, to, to, to the Southeast, in particular to Dr. Alex Ekweme in particular, who said, no, I don't want it, but uh, I will take it on behalf of the Southeast. Why? Because the gubernatorial elections had already taken place and the PDP won all the five Southeast states. So it was demonstrably strong in the region, whereas in Obasanjo's own Southwest zone, PDP did not win anything in 1999. So you have to make that concession. This time, is a bit tricky. For example, in APC, although APC has two Southeast governors, but you know, one came by defection, one came by one kind of Supreme <laughs> Court uh, ruling, so you are not even sure whether PD APC has any foothold in the Southeast. So one can even say, look, if we concede to the Southeast APC, the Senate president, how about if you don't elect any senator at all from the from the region, you know, there are considerations. So there will definitely be senators from the region. Either of the parties, you know, I mean, we're talking about, there will be a senator. We cannot definitely. really predict that, but the electorate as it stands right we now. We are talking actually, about senatorial uh, uh, we're, we're seeing the voting patterns really change as it stands right now, because even sitting senators, and lots of them, over 50 of them are not getting we're the not talking about political, to return. We're not talking about political parties. We mm -hmm. had an equal Madu as deputy senate president, even though, uh, the, the ruling political, the ruling party, that party that had majority of uh, members in the Senate was the APC. So it didn't matter. We, it, it has to come with some measure of understanding. Let's, let's face something. This country just has to make some progress. And integration matters a lot. The constant feeling of alienation by uh, the people of the Southeastern Nigeria has to stop. And so we, there's something, seconds, something gentlemen, deliberate the solution has to, to this, this, this marginalization you're speaking about, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, you know, we'll wrap this let us not say that it is on unprecedented or usual violence in the southeast that led to its being snubbed by the PDP. In fact, you know, good luck, Jonathan emerged as vice president simply to assuage, to placate the people of the Niger Delta who were having a militant movement over control of resources. One would have thought that the two major political parties would have been sensitive enough. We're considering the future of Nigeria. A people, I mean, the country that has fought the civil war, that is doing everything possible to tell its people, to tell the whole world that it is on a mission to unite everybody, to do, to make the concession of giving the Southeast a chance. Why, why should we, as a people, as a political parties, be haggling of our vice presidential candidates when the Southeast should have, as a matter of right, right. morally, gone for the presidency? Absolutely. Well, because for a for, for, for practicing politicians, the consideration is electoral. 
what do we do to win the election? It's not an issue of justice and, uh, and uh, this and that. You know, the most important thing is who will help the ticket to, 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 to win. And you can't sit outside the political parties and then dictate the morality to politicians because if they lose the election, absolutely, gentlemen, it's the cost yeah. to the dictatorship or the majority. I get your point. Democracy but at the end has day, to be inclusive. Let's not forget, there is one party looking at the main political parties that has zoning in this constitution. It did not adhere to that. But Mahmoud Jaga is saying, at the end of the day, parties have an election to win or lose. Good place to leave the conversation. I'd have to say thank you so much. Frank Tete, as well as Mahmoud Jaga, thank you so much for joining me tonight on the program.